Brian, welcome to In Search of Wisdom. Thank you for having me on. It is an absolute pleasure. I've been looking forward to it. And today we're going to be talking about your book, Taking Back Philosophy, a Multicultural Manifesto. I've really enjoyed going through it. And I found it an interesting read of how the book came to be. I was wondering if you could share the story of what led you to write the book. Yeah, sure. My friend and colleague, Jay Garfield, and I were at a conference organized by the Minorities and Philosophy Group at the University of Pennsylvania. And we were just chatting, and Jay said that he's been saying for years that a lot of philosophy departments in the contemporary West should change their names to departments of Western philosophy or departments of Anglo-European philosophy, because that's all they teach. They don't teach any of the philosophy in other parts of the world, the African tradition, the indigenous uh, traditions of the Americas, East Asian traditions or South Asian traditions. And I said, well, that's a great observation, Jay. We should maybe write an editorial talking about this and see if we can get it published somewhere. So we wrote it up and we didn't think we'd be able to get a really good venue for it. But just on a whim, we pitched it to the New York Times and they had some editorial suggestions and we edited it down a bit and it came out and just overnight it made a huge splash. So it got a lot more interaction on the New York Times website than most of their op-eds do, particularly ones dealing with cultural issues like philosophy. It ended up causing a lot of discussion and controversy at academic conferences. Several right-wing websites attacked us for failing to be sufficiently respectful or appreciative of the superiority of the Western intellectual tradition. And then a, an editor at Columbia University Press, Wendy Lochner, wrote us and said, wow, we're really excited about this. Have you considered writing a book about it? And Jay had a number of other commitments, but I agreed to write the book based on the New York Times article. And then Jay very generously wrote a foreword to it. And that book became Taking Back Philosophy, a Multicultural Manifesto. Well, I'm glad you did. It's fascinating. And from for someone that is not a professional philosopher and definitely outside the field, it's really surprising. And I'm sure for many of the listeners out there, they would be surprised to to read that as well. You provided, or maybe I heard it or read it, but some of the statistics around, I think if I remember right, 10% of philosophy departments offer something in Chinese philosophy and even lower than that when it gets to Indian philosophy and on. Exactly. And on the one hand, when people hear about this, sometimes the reaction is to say, yeah, but surely there isn't any philosophy in, in China or East Asia. Surely there isn't any philosophy in India or South Asia. But the fact is, as I explain in the book, when Europeans first discovered philosophy in East Asia, including Confucians, Taoists, Buddhists, and then later, when they first discovered philosophy from India, including works like the Bhagavad Gita and the various orthodox schools of Indian philosophy, they immediately recognized it as philosophy and were fascinated by it. In fact, leading figures in the European Enlightenment, like Leibniz, who is still a standard figure in the history of Western philosophy curriculum, were deeply enamored with Chinese philosophy. And Christian Wolff, whose name is not a, it's not a household name nowadays, but he's a major figure in the early enlightenment. He caused a lot of controversy by praising Chinese philosophers who, whom he identified as philosophers like Confucius and saying that in many ways they were superior to European philosophers. But then what happened with the rise of Western <coughs> economic imperialism, that's my French bulldog, announcing the arrival of the mailman who must be stopped. But then with the arrival, with the development of Western economic and then later military imperialism, there arose a wave of pseudoscientific racism. And I say pseudoscientific to point out that these theories of race were really invented in the, the 19th century and to some extent the 18th century. And they purported to be scientific theories, but they're not actually based on empirical observations. And they claim that the 
white race was superior to all others and hence was the only race capable of doing philosophy. And Immanuel Kant, who is a genuinely brilliant philosopher, of course, and whose work has been appropriated by many people in the cause of liberation and understanding human freedom. But ironically, Kant didn't invent, but he accepted these pseudoscientific notions of race. And he said in his lectures, which we still have, that only whites are capable of doing philosophy. So because of the great influence of Kant's ideas, his later followers rewrote the history of philosophy and wrote Asia and Africa out of the history of philosophy. And they made all of philosophy appear to start in ancient Greece. So the notion that all of philosophy starts in ancient Greece and that no other culture came up with philosophy is, first of all, it's just false if you bother to look at these other rich philosophical traditions. And it's not something that people have always thought. People started to think of it that way because of the rise of Western imperialism and pseudoscientific racism. Well, I definitely appreciate your work to shed light on that and raise that to us that are really outside the field of philosophy, but still searching for wisdom for daily life. I generally ask most people as an initial starting question of what got this whole search started? So I'm curious about that, but maybe also to tie in specifically this interest in Chinese philosophy as well, if you could share how it all started. Yeah, well, actually, it's funny. I often tell my students how I got interested in philosophy because it's a convoluted and funny story. When I was in high school, I decided to just go to the bookstore and grab a book of philosophy off the shelf. I think I just wanted to sound like an intellectual so I could use philosophical terms and make offhand comments about what philosophers thought. And the book I picked up, I remember reading it and pardon my language, but I just said, wow, this is BS. There's, there's no reason anybody should be interested in philosophy. This is, this is just absolutely pointless intellectual game playing. And so I set it aside. Then a few years later, they reinstituted registration for the draft for 18 year old males. And I was doing debate interscholastic debate in high school, and we debated, should there be a reinstitution of the draft? If there is a reinstitution of the actual draft, do you have to go? And so I began to think about the obligations of the individual to the state, and to what extent can my community ask me to do things that I might disagree with or even regard as morally abhorrent? And now I return to philosophy and it was exciting and interesting because I could see the practical relevance of the issues to my actual life. And so I always tell my students, if you're reading a philosopher, even one that sounds very abstract and otherworldly, if you don't understand why these issues bother them as a human being, then you don't understand that philosopher. The most Abstract philosophy, if it's great philosophy, it's ultimately grounded in a conception of what it is to live well and what the problems facing human beings are. So that second time I got interested in philosophy, I really cared about it. And a, another story I like to tell my students is Plato can be one of the most abstract and theoretically complicated of philosophers. But we actually have a letter surviving from Plato called the seventh letter or the seventh epistle. There's some controversy over whether it's authentic. I think it is authentic. Even if it's not, it clearly represents a view someone in the early Platonic movement in ancient times thought was plausible about Plato's views. So it's clearly a plausible Platonic view. And in the letter, Plato says that he started to do philosophy because of the corruption he saw in Athens. And he came to realize that both wings, I mean, they didn't have left and right wings in ancient Athens, but they were basically the small d Democrats, the people who believed in rule of the many. And then there were the aristocrats, the people who believed in rule by the wealthy and those with hereditary ability, supposedly. And both wings, he said, he saw both of them in power in the aftermath of the Peloponnesian War. And he said both of them were corrupt. 
And he came to realize that there will be no end to problems in society until either rulers become philosophers or philosophers become rulers. And what Plato meant by philosophers wasn't academic nerds like me. What <laughs> Plato meant by philosophers was true lovers of wisdom, people who were actually committed to living well and had learned through a process of education what it was to live well and could be relied upon to do the right thing, even in the face of temptation. And so all of Plato's philosophy is about figuring out how do we cultivate these individuals? And he knows that we don't find virtue in ordinary Athenian society. And he'd say the same thing about our society. But he says, given the right environment, you can produce people who are virtuous. You can cultivate virtue in individuals. And those are the individuals that you want in positions of authority. And then if you're skeptical about that, you say, ah, well, that's, this is why I don't believe in philosophy, because I think that you can't cultivate virtue in individuals the way that Plato thought. Well, then you're a Hobbesian. And so you're a philosopher anyway. It's just you're a different kind of philosopher. And so there are philosophers who take that route as well. But any stance you take, you're going to be taking a philosophical stance on these issues. Like, how do you cultivate virtue? Or if you think you can't cultivate virtue, okay, how is society going to work if you can't cultivate virtue? Fair enough. But... What's your theory? It's so interesting and such an important point. And maybe before we get into it, it could be helpful if you could share your definition of what is philosophy. Yeah, that's another great question. And I think that we can't come up with a definition of philosophy, even if we just limit it to the term philosophia in ancient Greek and its cognates in other languages. The things that people called philosophers have done historically have varied so greatly. So at a certain point in history, I mean, this is why Neil deGrasse Tyson has it in for philosophy, the science educator, and I admire him as a science educator, but he's really got it in for philosophy. I think because he had a run-in with some philosophers who pointed out that there were some physicists who were making claims about the origin of the universe that you actually couldn't defend philosophically. And they pointed out the mistakes in them. And he got angry that, you know, he was being corrected. But in, in any case, Neil deGrasse Tyson has a PhD. And so if you get a doctorate in physics or chemistry or mathematics, it's a PhD, which stands for doctor of philosophy. Why is that? Because the people who got doctorates and philosophers were the first physicists. They were the first mathematicians. If you had told, for example, Newton that he was not a philosopher, he would have been offended. He would have said, of course, I'm a philosopher. I'm a natural philosopher. What do you mean? I'm not a philosopher. So if we try to define what philosophy is, some of what philosophy is has become separate fields. As we figured out the right methodology for doing mathematics or physics or astronomy or biology, those spin off as separate fields with their own methodology. And so, but I think if we want to ask, well, what is philosophy for us now? Right. There's no one definition that covers everybody who's been a philosopher at some point in history. But what is philosophy for us now? Philosophy is the discipline in which we discuss issues that we agree are important, but we don't yet agree about the methodology for resolving them. If we agree more or less about the methodology for resolving them, then it becomes a specialized discipline like mathematics or physics or biology. But when the issues are important to us, but we don't agree about the methodology for resolving them yet, that kind of dialogue is philosophical. And what kinds of issues are still like that? Issues in ethics, issues about the ultimate structure of the universe. In other words, if you, an example I like to use with my students is, suppose you say, well, I don't believe in philosophy. I just believe in natural science. And then you say, and then I say, okay, so do you think natural science tells us everything there is to know about the universe? And if they say yes, I say, well, bang, you're a naturalist. That's a philosophical position. But science can't tell you that everything there is to know about the universe can be described by science. That would be circular. You've got to step outside the boundary of natural science to say, okay, I guess everything 
that is significant is discussed by natural science. I think that's a naive position. I think there are many things that natural science can't tell us. But the point is, even if you try to formulate that position, you're taking a stance on a philosophical issue. So that's what I mean by ultimate questions about what's the structure of the universe? Is there anything to the universe that science can't tell us about? That's a philosophical question. Is there a purpose to life? Or if there's not a purpose to life, okay, that's also a philosophical position. What is the obligation of the individual to her or his community? That question that got me started, that's a philosophical issue. And we don't agree about the methodology for resolving these issues, but we can see they're clearly important issues to us. And for me, that's what philosophy is now. And then if we look at other cultures like ancient China or Japan or Korea or Vietnam and East Asia or what is now India or other parts of Southeast Asia, we find that people are clearly addressing these issues and they're addressing it using methods which are often very similar to the ones that are given in Western philosophy. So by any plausible standard, people are doing philosophy in these traditions. I found it heartbreaking to read the chapter where you're talking about the political debate in the U.S., just basically not giving any sort of value to, to philosophy as a field. How did we get there? Was that something that has existed all throughout time? Yeah, the one of the best commentators on culture to this day is Alexis de Tocqueville, and he wrote this classic work, Democracy in America. And he was a French visitor to the United States, but he was remarkably insightful about what's distinctive about Americans. And he said that both the greatest strength but also the greatest weakness of the American people is they tend to be anti-intellectual or the way they phrase it is they're anti-elitist. So the anti-elitism of the American people, on the one hand, it's a strength because Americans tend to think, oh, so your dad's a duke and your mom's a duchess. Who cares? What have you done? He said, that's a really impressive attitude that we can really admire. But the other side of it is that everybody thinks they're equally qualified to talk about all issues. And so the person who knows nothing about natural science thinks that they're entitled to pontificate on natural science. And the person who knows nothing about foreign affairs thinks that they're, they know as much as people who spent their entire life studying foreign affairs. And I, I think we see this to the present day. But kind of the irony, though, and the thing that I think Tocqueville didn't see and couldn't have seen is we do have an, a very elitist society in the United States, but the kinds of things we admire are disconnected from actual intellectual achievement. So in the United States, we really admire professional athletes. And I'm not here to dump on professional athletes, but, you know, something like, well, I'm, this person's really good at hitting a ball with a stick. And like, oh, no, but this person's really good at throwing a ball, so it's really hard to hit with a stick. And we happen to be friends with somebody who's a former a minor league pitcher. And just you play with him, like, just like with like wiffle ball. It's, it is amazing what the guy can do. And he's not, he wasn't even that good and his arms blown out, but he can still like, like, how do you even do that with a ball? But the thing is, this is not a useful skill for any purpose besides this silly game that we came up with. But Americans are like, oh, you're good at throwing a ball, so it's hard to hit with a stick. That's somebody I'm going to take seriously about what they think about the world. That's not a, a good start for a culture. Or I would just think about it the other day, who are some of the commentators on current affairs who are taken the most seriously in the United States and have the widest audience? Well, I mean, not to name names, but we've got a like a pothead who's got like one of the most popular podcasts in the world. He's a former fighting sports commentator. Millions of people hanging on his every word. We've got a lounge comic who's got a show where he interviews celebrities about current events, whose major accomplishment is a movie, The Avocado Jungle of Death. We've got a former someone who lucked out and got an Academy Award winning role, but who's again, another former lounge comic who now gets to host a show that millions of people watch on network television and pontificate about issues he's done no reading on. 
this is not a good basis for a civilization where we're listening to the people who are the least informed and have the least qualifications. And I understand often people who have really good qualifications can make mistakes too. There were, you know, people who should have known better who said, and this reference, look it up if you're, if this is like too old fashioned of a reference for our audience, but there were doctors who said, oh, thalidomide is completely safe for pregnant women to take. And that turned out to be disastrous. There were, there was a time in U.S. history when children were taken out into the desert to watch atomic bomb tests because uh, experts said, oh, the radiation is not going to be a problem. It's, you know, the, and there are people, especially in parts of the Western United States who were developed cancer as a result of being exposed to U.S. nuclear tests. And they were told this was absolutely safe. So I understand why people can be skeptical of experts. Experts can make mistakes too. But if you have to choose between somebody who spent their life studying somebody and somebody who's a third-rate lounge comic to be your source of information about the world, I don't think this should be a hard choice. And this really, it goes back to both Plato and Confucius. Plato and Confucius disagreed about a lot, but they both lived in societies that were in crisis. And they both were convinced the way to solve this crisis is to get the right people with practical wisdom to bring up the theme of the podcast, into positions of government authority. And they both believed it was possible to cultivate these, this virtue of practical wisdom in human beings. And so that's the vision that they had. And I still think there's a lot of power to that vision today. It's so interesting, this idea of being a specialist, I guess, if you will, compared to, like yourself, a comparative philosophy. You have an interest in Buddhism, Chinese philosophy, Indian philosophy. What are the benefits of a more comparative approach? Like maybe you can be a specialist, but you also take the time to broaden, you know, your perspective and explore other traditions. Yeah, well, I think there are a lot of benefits to just having a broad education. And so for example, and this came up in with the excellent podcast you recently did with Sky Cleary, one of the major schisms in intellectual traditions is between people who think that your essence precedes your existence versus your existence precedes your essence. And that slogan, I mean, that's one of those things where you hear it and you're like, oh, this is people trying to sound smart and just using complicated words. But when you get the distinction, it's really interesting. And I bring this up as well when I'm teaching the history of thought. To what extent do people think you've got an essence which is defined by a higher power? Maybe that's God. Maybe it's Tian, heaven in the East Asian traditions. Maybe it's Brahman in the Orthodox traditions but you've got some higher power that defines what it is.